you have a very you 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 mentioned that with your past student you were able to genome uh, the sequence of these bees and then and that's, that's how you guys were able to realize that their their genome was different. Your part of a project is called the Earth Biogenome Project, which mm -hmm. the goal is to sequence the genome of all species in the, on Earth. Mm -hmm. How does the work look like once we have the genome of all the species on Earth? Mm -hmm. So um, the Earth Biogenome Project is is a project for the infrastructure for biology for the 21st century. It's uh, a repository, a highway system, um, the next Alexandria Library, whatever analogy you'd like to use, meaning that it holds, it, it when, when the project will be finished, it will hold information that um, many different kinds of biologists, <coughs> excuse me, will be able to, to use. So the structure of the project is, it sounds very simple. Um, uh, specimen acquisition, we need to collect uh, representatives of all species and um, then sequence their genomes, um, then analyze their genomes and make that information available to the world, uh, publicly available. It, uh, it's, it's easy to say that. It's, it's each step that I've just described is, of course, incredibly complex, but in outlines, the outline of the project is, is very simple. And uh, um, if we, to the extent that we have that, and we already have many genomes, but nowhere near uh, um, all, we just have a tiny fraction, um, we, we can see the power of, of that knowledge and can be used. Because a genome really, so I kind of like the library analogy, because a genome is really the ultimate book of life. And the reason why I say that is because you can read a genome as a history book, that is, you can learn about the past. You can read the genome as a parts list, that is a present tense, here's how you build an organism, um, plant, human, microbe, whatever. And you could read the genome as a prophecy to predict um, traits and variation uh, between individuals and, and so forth. And so same book can be read as a history book, as a parts list and as a prophecy. Um, so I could give you some examples if you'd like. Please. So um, uh, you probably uh, heard that the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded to Svante Pabo for work on human origins. That work was based on some amazing breakthroughs that uh, Professor Pabo made together with colleagues to be able to read ancient DNA, to be able to collect DNA from fossils, from the floors of caves, and um, just some amazing technical virtuosity to be able to read DNA. Uh, we used to think that it just is degraded, there's no way, um, but uh, Svante Pablo was, one, was the first to be able to pioneer these new methods and allowed us to peer into the past. So. Um, Prior to this work in ancient DNA, it was thought that the Neanderthals, a hominid, similar, some similar traits to humans, Homo sapiens, that, that the Neanderthals were a kind of a mysterious group of human-like organisms that um, mysteriously disappeared. And uh, people didn't really know what happened to them. They saw them and the older human uh, evolution textbooks, uh, anthropology textbooks, would saw them as distinct from Homo sapiens. Well, uh, thanks to the work on Neanderthals, for which um, Dr. Pablo got the Nobel Prize, uh, we now know that there was contact with, uh, between Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals. There was breeding, so uh, genomes don't lie. You can you can see that. So if you have the genomes of Neanderthals, genomes of Homo sapiens, you can use sophisticated computer programs to say, hey, there was some fooling around going on here between these, these two groups and giving us new appreciation for intermingling of populations. Um, we now know, and if you um, look at 23andMe, they sort of have a Neanderthal um, feature on the program. You can ask what percentage of a person's genome is inherited from the Neanderthals. Some, it's interesting from a, a curiosity point of view, but 
it's also interesting from a biomedical point of view because uh, to, back to your question about selective pressures and evolution, Neanderthals faced different evolutionary pressures, different environmental pressures. They evolved different ways of dealing with them and some of those uh, make uh, present day humans more susceptible to diseases or less susceptible to diseases. And so it's just a whole new window on um, human evolution by reading the genome as a, as a history book. Reading the genome as a parts list, um, that's a little easier to just envision. Um, so um, we uh, are starting more and more to understand the functions of genes. We're still way off from knowing all of them. Probably we, we probably only know the functions of about a quarter of the genes in the human genome, if you can believe that. So we have so much more to learn. The way we learn about it more and more is the comparative approach. So the more genomes we have, more species, more experiments can be done, the more we can learn um, about the function of genes. There are also new techniques in human biology, um, organoids, brain organoids, tissue organoids, to be able to, that you can manipulate genes and look at functions. So um, the more we know there, then we understand better the parts list of what's, what's here and how that differs from species to species and how that it gives rise to the differences that we see um, between individuals and between species. And then finally, as a prophecy. So it's possible to look at genomes, analyze genomes with sophisticated programs and be able to start to see uh, differences that we can understand, say between plant species, some plants might have variants of genes that allow them to be more resilient in, in times of climate change. And so we can predict their response. Um, we can predict different health susceptibilities in humans um, for, uh, on the basis of some genes, just for some diseases, not very many yet, because we're still in such early days. But if you can read a genome sort of backwards, as it were, history, present day, and future, you can see how valuable they are. And if we had all the species on the planet and could do large scale comparative analyses across these species, we would just have an amazing treasure trove of, of information to draw upon um, for inquiries in various areas, whether it's ecology, evolution, development, neuroscience, uh, endocrinology, medicine, um, you name it. Right. And the implications, as you mentioned, are limitless once we figure it out and 